Hi, my name is Eve and I'm a resuscitation training lead here at Bradford Teaching Hospitals. So what we're going to show you here today is a basic life support scenario. If you've done basic life support before, this may look slightly different to things that you've done in the past. The reason for that is because of the lovely virus COVID-19. We've got to make some adjustments to make sure that we are all safe. So the massive emphasis on safety. The Resuscitation Council UK treats chest compressions as an aerosol generating procedure and because of that we need to make sure that we are fully donned in the appropriate PP before we start chest compressions. You'll see the demonstration in almost real time and then you'll see it again broken down with some speech throughout to explain what we're doing and why we're doing it. This demonstration is in a ward environment it may be that this event happens outside of a ward environment and we'll talk about slight adjustments that you might need to make towards the end of the demonstration. Okay, if you've got any questions at the end, then feel free to speak to the instructor that's with you today. Thank you. Morning, Barb. I'm Paul. I've just come to do your arts. How are you doing this morning? Barb? Barb? Start CPR. 
So what you're going to see now is that demonstration again, this time with me talking through those steps. Morning Bob, how are you doing? So Paul has come to assess Bob there and she's recognised that he's unresponsive. Bob, can you hear me? So now she's just squeezing his shoulders a little bit for some painful stimulus and asking if he can hear her. She recognises that he's Bob. unresponsive. She's feeling for a central pulse, which you should do if you are trained to do so. She's also observing Bob for any other signs of life, such as a rise and fall of his chest or any movement. After 10 seconds, she realises that there are no signs of life. I need some help, please. I've got an emergency. Can I have the crash call? I need a crash call. So in a ward environment, we've got a alarm buzzer that Paula has activated there. Also, she's put that shout out for some more assistance and asked for a crash call to be made. The crash call is going to vary depending on your location. Double two, double two, if you are inside the main hospital building, stating adult cardiac arrest, they will then send the crash team to you. If you're on site, but outside of the main building, still double two, double two, but you're also going to need to phone for the emergency ambulance as well. If you're based at St. Luke's, double two, double two, you'll get a first response team and you need to phone 999 as well. Any community areas, obviously it's just a 999 call. So because Paula is not donned in relevant PPE, she cannot start CPR straight away. So what she's doing is attaching the defibrillator to the patient. She's exposed the chest. If there was thick chest hair, she may need to shave the chest or wipe it dry if there's some moisture. Removing the plug from the test socket on the defibrillator, she's then going to plug the pads in. There's only one way it will go, so it's just arrow to arrow and attach. Once that's plugged in, we turn the defibrillator on. This defibrillator switches on in manual mode, so at the moment it is not prompting. So what we need to do is make this an automatic device. So what we need to do is analyse the electrical activity within the heart. The on button is button number one. We go to button number two and on that it says analyse. We push analyse. Analyzing now. Stand clear. And the defib will decide whether we need to shock or not. Analyze. It's advising a shock and charging. Stand clear. Push to shock. It states stand clear and push to shock. So Paula will do safety checks. Nice and easy. She's the only one in the room. Nobody's near the patient, so we can now push button number three and deliver the shock safely. Start CPR. Now Paula can't start CPR because she's not donned in the appropriate PPE. So what she needs to do is ensure the room is set up as best as possible, ready for that team to arrive. So preparing the area as best we can for the team to arrive, you can see Paula releasing the break of the bed, moving the bed away from the wall and remembering to place the break back on. We now need to think about whoever is going to be doing CPR. We need to make sure we lower the bed to its lowest possible setting in order to make CPR as appropriate as we can, laying the bed flat if it's lifted as such. She now needs to remove the pillow from underneath the patient's head so we can manage the airway. If there was a head on the end of the bed there, we would also need to remove that as well. Now it appears as though there is as much room as we can gain, so when the team come, we can all manage safely. Is anyone ready in the PPE, please? Hi. Hi, guys. Before you start CPR, because I'm not safe, I just need to hand over. This is Bob. He's 65 years old. Um, he's had a uh, post two day of surgery, um, unexplained collapse. He's had one defib shock. Okay, thank you. I'm going to exit the room. I'll man the trolley. So what you've just seen there is Paula give a handover of information about the patient. She's done that so they have a clear understanding of what's going on. She was not safe being in the room whilst they started CPR because she didn't have the relevant PPE on. So the team are now free to start CPR. Right, I'll do the 
So we've seen the team allocate roles there quite effectively. We know who's manning the DFib, who's doing CPR, and who is managing the airway and delivering ventilations. What we're seeing is 30 chest compressions. The hands are in the centre of the chest. The palm of the hand is flat to the chest. We're compressing approximately one third or five to six centimetres in depth and allowing for a full recoil. That will empty the heart as much as possible, get that blood circulating around the body, keeping vital organs alive. Ideally, when we're leading up to 30, we can count down the final few. Then we know we need to be ready to ventilate. Communication is key. Okay, So as we can see, we're following the prompts of the DFib. Whilst the machine is charging, it's safe to continue CPR. After delivering that shock, again following the prompts of the defib, we're back onto the chest and continuing 30 chest compressions to two ventilations. So I'll now talk you through the ventilation process. So we need to make sure that we're as safe as possible. So as well as being donned in PPE, we need to make sure that there is a viral filter attached between the mask and between the bag. And that will be on your crash trolley or with your resuscitation equipment. We have attached the bag valve mask to 15 litres or 100% oxygen. So this might be via a wall port or it might be an oxygen cylinder, whatever you've got available. Once we're attached and ready to go, we place the mask on the face. The pointed part of the mask goes over the bridge of the nose and the curve in the cleft of the chin. You can see we've got a C shape with our finger and thumb, then three fingers underneath the chin so we can tilt the head back, pulling the face into the mask. Once we're ready to go, between those chest compressions, we'll have clear communication between the team. We squeeze that bag and we're going to squeeze it twice to deliver those two ventilations. We would then get back onto the chest and continue that ratio of 30 chest compressions and two ventilations. <laughs> 